read you a little story here if you want to hear one. God was missing for six days. Eventually, Michael the archangel found him resting on the seventh day. He inquired, where have you been? God smiled deeply and proudly pointed downwards through the clouds. Look, Michael, look what I've made. Archangel Michael looked puzzled and said, what is it? It is a planet, replied God, and I have put life on it. I, I'm going to call it Earth, and it's going to be a place to test balance. It's going to be a place to test balance. Are you listening, everybody? It's very important that you hear this. Balance, inquired Michael. I'm still confused. Well, God explained, pointing to different parts of Earth. For example, Northern Europe will be a place of great opportunity and wealth, while Southern Europe is going to be poor. Over here, I placed a continent of white people, and over here, a continent of black people, balancing all things. God continued pointing to different uh, countries, this one will be extremely hot, this one will be extremely cold, covered with ice. The archangel, impressed by God's work, then pointed to a land area and said, what is, what, what, what is that one? That's West Virginia. That's the most glorious place on earth. There are beautiful mountains, rivers and streams, lakes, forests, hills and plains. The people from West Virginia are going to be handsome, modest, intelligent and humorous. They're going to travel the world. They will be extremely sociable, hand, hard working, hard achieving, or high achieving, carriers of peace and pro producers of good things. Michael gasped in wonder and admiration. Then, but then asked, but what about balance, God? You said there would be balance. Oh, God smiled and said, yeah, right next to West Virginia is Washington, D.C. Wait till you see the idiots I put there. I think that's pretty good myself. That's something I had in my that's something I had in my files. I'm going through my, all my stuff in my office. Sermons from back in 1970s and 80s. <laughs> that was back there somewhere. So it must have been bad then. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. After this manner, Jesus talking. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the model prayer. A prayer of all Christian people. Christ said, after this manner, pray ye. Teaching prayer. Ever, never, never, ever has this country needed prayer more than it needs it now. Never, ever has the church of Jesus Christ needed prayer more than it needs it right now. Amen. Never, ever in the history of this country has our homes needed prayer as much as it needs it now. Amen. You see, there's some things here. I got a number of things, and I ain't going to get it all done tonight, I'm sure. But in this prayer, and in our lives, as we combine them, I... Uh, I have an interesting thing going to happen to me tomorrow. As you have known, I have been, a re I have been acquainted with a brother that I have never met. He lives in California. I knew I had a brother in California ever since I was 14 years old. I knew that. I never knew how old he was. I never knew his name. I never knew anything other than that I had a brother in California. I never tried to reach out to him because of the circumstances. See, I did not want to know who my father was. 
I was tickled to death to be a Seba. You see what I'm saying? I was shocked to find out I wasn't, and I was disappointed from that point on. I was never to be told. I was never to be told that I was not Virgo Julius Seba's son, but I was. So I left it alone. I did not want to mess up anybody else's. I'm not going to find out who anybody is. I don't, you know, it is, it is. I'll meet him in heaven if he gets there. That's all I ever said. Couldn't, I couldn't find out who he was anyway because I didn't know his name. Never thought anything about it. Well, five, about five weeks ago, he found out at the age of 79 years old that Mr. Young was not his father. Bingo. Guess who was his father? My father. So he found out all about these things and he did not want to reach out to anybody because he was upset. No one had told him. It was a shock to him after his mother and father were dead. All of a sudden now at 79 years old, someone has informed him, this is not your father. I have a picture upstairs in my office of him when he was a baby, long before I was born. I did not know exactly by looking at that picture at that time who, uh, what, who he was. I assumed he was Middleton's, Mr. Middleton's son, and, uh, but I never speculated, didn't even care, to be honest with you. I just knew that that was a father. I, that was, I uh, assuming, my father's son. But like I said, I didn't reach out. I didn't care. I had too many shocks in my life as a kid growing up. I didn't need any more. So anyway, finally, he was very reluctant to meet any of the family. I don't blame him. He had heard about me. I, I texted him. I said, Marlon, don't let none of this affect you. Go on with your life just like always. Leave it alone. Just go on with your life. Enjoy it. Don't worry about it. You're too old. You don't need to worry about it. Just stay. So anyway, he, had, he started texting me back and forth. We've texted almost uh, a little twice, a, uh, twice a week probably. Tomorrow at 2.30 our time, he's calling me. We're going to visit. I have found out some things about him. You're not going to believe this, but he's a Chiefs lover. Why wouldn't anybody in California be a Kansas City Chiefs lover? Just happened to be my brother. <clears throat> he, found, he became a Chiefs lover when Joe Montana came to Kansas City. That's how I found that out. But he, at, uh, at the age of 79 years old, was shocked to find out that his mother did not tell him who his father was. But you know what I told him? I said, you're better off for it. You did not need to know the man. It was not, it was not important for you to know him. Because he didn't want to know you. He didn't want to know anybody, personally. So I left it alone. So he, him and I have talked, we've laughed. He, uh, he watches our sermons on YouTube. He, he compliments the sermons every day. Me and, me, he's going to remarry. His first wife has died of Alzheimer's. And uh, he was seven years been single, and he found a young lady when he was working out at the gym that was a widow. And um, they decided they wanted to travel and see some things, and he said, no, I don't do that unless we're married. And so they're going to get married in March. And then they're going to travel a little bit together. He's fact, he's going to be here at Elm Grove Baptist Church sometime in April. He's going to visit his new wife's sister that one of them lives in Texas, one lives in Alabama, then he's coming up here to spend some time with me. But he said to me something that I thought was kind of unique. He said, Sandy, in a text, both of my brothers have died. And I have not been the same since then. He says, it's almost as if God turned around and gave me a brother. I am so delighted that I have one. And you never know who you're going to find and what kind of person or what kind of character that person's going to be. And uh, uh, my, uh, my brother down there is a very successful businessman, has been all of his life. And um, he found out I was a preacher. And so he's, uh, he's delighted. He claims to trust Jesus as his Savior. 
I'll find out a little bit more about that tomorrow when I talk to him. But I'm going to be sitting at my home at 2.30 tomorrow talking to a man I have never talked to before in my life that is my biological brother. So you might pray for me. So the thing that I think is funny, there's a man that comes to church here. I don't know if you guys know Mr. Sparks. He sits back there, back against the wall back there. And uh, he looks just like my brother. That I see. I showed him the picture of him. I showed his wife. He goes, okay. I said, every time I see uh, Mr. Sparks come in, I go, yeah. But anyway, prayer. You see, a model prayer is not the kind of, it's just a model prayer. It's teaching you something. It's a, it's a teaching prayer. See, when you pray, you should pray from your heart. But God wants you to know, here is how to pray. You pray like this. Now, when you pray, I suggest to you that you, re, you pray from your heart. Dear God, I love you. I think the first thing you should ever say to God when you pray is, I love you. I think that's the first thing you should say. I love you. I love you because you first love me. So anyway, I think that when you pray, I think you should pray and thank him for all that he's done for you for, for, before you ever ask for one thing. It's a model prayer. Notice it goes like this. After this manner, therefore pray ye. And do it like this, he says, after this manner. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, how great art thou. And is he? Yes, he is. You see, it's worshiping in spirit and in truth. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Such claim on, uh, a, you see, a sinner cannot pray that prayer. Actually, he has no claim on God as Father. Right. You're not a, look, you see, everybody, I've heard people say, and you have too, we're all God's children. Have you ever heard that? That's not true. That's false. We are all God's creation. Amen. You become a child of God when you receive Jesus Christ, his son, as your savior. Right. Then, and not until then, you become his son. As many as receive him, Jesus, to them became the sons of God. You see, I'm a child of God through Jesus Christ and through Jesus only. I am God's creation as you are. But I'm his son through my faith in his son. I'm a son of God. By the way, I am also co, uh, I'm, I'm co-equal with Jesus Christ. I'm as much a son to God as his son. Right. We're co-equal. Everything Jesus has, we have. All things that his are ours, according to the Bible. Jesus loves us. He loves us more than we can imagine how much he loves us. God loves us more than we can even think to give us all that he has just by trusting his son. You see, worshiping in spirit and truth. When we pray, we pray in the spirit with the truth. Now notice, a sinner cannot call God his father for he does not have any such claim uh, on God. He must be born again before he can address God as father. Do you agree with that? Amen. Being born again is big. It's a must. Jesus said so. You must be born again. It's a must in order to claim what is yours. See, you can't imagine. You're sitting in this room here. You can't imagine what you had. I can't imagine it. I can't even claim. I can't even. What he has is what we have. He has given it to us. Now, there is a coming of God's kingdom. All rejoice. It is not all going to be bad. Like it's out there right now. I mean, we got a president that don't know his name, probably. 
We got a country that's not being run by a president. We have a country all of a sudden that has eliminated God. And by the way, you're going to find that out in the next few years. Right. You see, we pray in that prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Is that what it says? Coming of God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Verse number 10 there. Christ commands here that we pray for the coming of God's kingdom. When you pray that prayer, be careful what you're praying for. You're praying for the kingdom of God to come. Well, I can't wait for that. I can't wait. I mean, as I get older, I told someone just the other day, um, Bob Adrian and I meet. Um, Bob Adrian's a pastor of the Liberty Baptist Church over here on Parallel. Him and I's birthday's the same day. We, 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 have, we have lunch together every 15th of December. Um, he buys my lunch that day and I buy his. In other words, we try to figure out who can eat the most that day. <laughs> but he is my friend. He tells me every time he sees me how much he loves me. He said, I appreciate our fellowship, our friendship. I appreciate the times. We don't spend a lot of time together. But um, we spend uh, once a month together. Tomorrow is that day. But he said to me, he says, you know what? As we get older, he's two years older than I am. He says, as we get older, I was thinking, well, it's going to end for us. He said, well, think about it, Sandy. He says, it's just about to begin again. He says, thy kingdom come. He says, Jesus' kingdom is about to come. He said, the rapture is close. He says, it's right around the corner. He said, man, I says, he said, the more I live now, the more I think I'm going to see it. I get excited when he thinks about that. Wouldn't that be great? That I kingdom come. All right. Christ commands here that we pray for the coming of God's kingdom. It will come and we should pray for its coming. And by the way, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pray this next four years for the coming of king, the kingdom of God. What better thing to pray for? Can you think about that? Think, what better thing to pray for than the kingdom come? So when you pray that prayer, thy kingdom come, you're asking his kingdom to come. That 1,000 year millennial reign. Now before that takes place, of course, there's going to be some excitement. There's going to be a rapture. Boom! Out of here. On the way up, I'm going to be changed to a six foot three. Unbelievable. Don't laugh, Jim. Because I'm telling you, you're going down to five foot and six. <laughs> and anyway, on the way up, we get a new body. Amen? We get a new body. Now, I didn't always have this. I don't know how it got there. A lot of time and money. <laughs> Rick says, a lot of time and a lot of, you say candy? Oh, honey buns? And just, I don't want to, I'm going to say something to you. Am I only one? Does anybody here get a craving flung upon you? You don't. See, you guys are, some of you are just godly. Because, you know, I can drive by quick trip and a craving is flung upon me. Yeah. It's not coffee. It's them. Have you ever seen that donut display? <laughs> Have you guys ever seen that? I'm talking about them chocolate. How many likes caramel long johns? <laughs> uh, you can't eat that. Don't tell me that. I'm 75. <laughs> We're only guaranteed 70 years. I mean, you know what? I live five years past that. Let me have a donut. Amen. I found out today I can't eat nothing. <laughs> Steak. Oh, that's good. Hamburger, no bread. Any chicken, no potatoes. I can't eat nothing that I want to eat, that I like to eat. And no, by the way, and see, because I have ate what I wanted to eat, not because what I'm supposed to eat, I look like this.
Some of you guys are spiritual. God bless you. <laughs> Lady said, would you like to have a malt? I said, I'd love to have five of them, ma'am. I said, but my, everybody that knows me won't let me have one. What would you like to have? The only thing I can have, water. <laughs> you know? Yeah, look here. I want you to know, you guys, I'm sitting up here obeying the rules. But the thing I get excited about in this prayer is thy kingdom come. But look, when I come back with Jesus for his rule and reign for 1,000 years, I'm going to be a lean, mean fighting machine. Because I'll get a new body on my way up. Amen. And I won't have time to defile it. <laughs> well, I'm coming back. <laughs> Glad you think that's funny. Besides that, when we come back and eat with Jesus, he, we ain't going to have anything out there that's going to defile our body. Right. We're going to eat good. We're going to eat salary. Get used to the idea. Some of you guys that don't like salary. Now, in that prayer, it goes like this. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Did you ever, did you ever just think about that verse right here? Now, you guys know how good it is in heaven. And you guys also know how bad it is on earth. That all changes right here in this verse. Isn't that right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Woo. I, I get that kingdom is going to be good, isn't it? I don't know how that works exactly. Because the restructure of the earth is in Revelation later down the road. So therefore, it must be similar to like it's going to be right now. The rapture is going to take place. We're going to be a terrible war down here and here. The Armageddon is going to take place. And we come back and rule and reign for a thousand years to what's left of this earth. Now, I don't know. I, I've read books. I've read what other people think. But God don't say. Sometimes it's not too good to speculate what we're going to do. Because, and I'm not going to do that because God didn't say. I assume we'll rule and reign for a thousand with, years with the Lord, like it says. Where we will rule at, I don't know. People say, well, you're going to rule over there in Jerusalem. No, there's going to be people born over here too. Isn't that right? That's the way I see it. You think maybe possibly us Christians will have a, some kind of a position. I may become mayor of Bonner. Or Baser. Huh? You want to be Mayor Baser? Oh. Well, Brother Brother you can be Mayor Baser. I'll be Mayor Bonner. We can have fellowship. You know, we have a, a weekly meeting for 1,000 years. But we're going to be in the kingdom. The kingdom is the key there. We're going to be under the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ who has set up his kingdom. We're going to be ruling with him. A lot of good things there, folks. A lot of good thoughts. Now, we go, we're, not, we're not smart enough just to really figure out what we're going to do. Because we don't know. We can only speculate like I'm doing right here. It's not gospel what I'm saying right now. It's speculation. I do know the gospel is this. We will rule and reign with Christ. That's gospel. What we'll do, we don't know. Well, I guess we do know. We'll rule and reign with Christ. But it's God's kingdom. And there's going to be eternal righteousness in the earth. Now, can you imagine earth having an eternal righteousness in it <laughs> compared to what we know right now? You don't see it now, do you? I mean, people get mad at me over my driving. Some of you guys 
sitting back there going, I don't know, I don't blame him. Now, the reason for that is that at 75, I slow down a little bit. Used to be, I would drive 10 miles over the speed limit. Now I drive 10 miles under the speed limit. That seems to upset folk. But, and when I upset folk, they, they, they say things. Now, I don't know what they're saying, but I'm a pretty good lip reader. And there's not really a lot good there that's really coming out of their mouth that I can see. The, but on this earth, we see people, we can, we can identify a heathen sometimes just by the sticker, the bumper sticker on their vehicle. You know? So I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of that. I, I, today, uh, Debbie and I was went to the bank. We was coming down 7 Highway toward McDonald's. There was a wreck down there. I mean, we, when I was coming off of, of Nettleton down to get on 7 Highway, I, there was just, it's a, the highway was just blocked, stopped. All I can see ahead, way up there by, 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 on the Walmart side of the 7, uh, just lights and lights and lights flashing. And I said, well, it looks like there's an accident up there. Of course, now you expect accidents in the weather that we have right now. Because, you know, people, when the snow comes, the ice comes, people forget how to drive. They think they can drive like it's 75 degrees outside. See, they can't do that. But in the education system we got today, they don't teach that. Just, just do what you want. Kill yourself if you want to. So as we slowly creep by the accident, there was two gentlemen, excuse me, two men, uh, excuse me, Two heathen cussing each other. Bam, 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 bam. And I said, whoa. And I noticed the police walking toward them because the police evidently sensed what I sensed as I was driving by. Somebody's going to throw a punch here real quick, like somebody's mad. Well, that's the world we live in then. See, the Bible says, why do the heathen rage? And that what it say? Why do the heathen rage? Because they're heathen. That's why they rage. You see, the answer is in the question. Why do the heathen rage? We're living in a heathenistic world. We went through, a, we went through an election that was phony. I got a call from somebody wanting to know why I did not donate to the election in Georgia. I said, because I knew how it was going to come out. There was no question in my mind there was not what it was going to be. I don't think you ever have a fair election in this country anymore. You know why? Because the heathen is raging. And as long as the heathen rage, in this world that we live in, not the kingdom of God, but the king of this world, you're not going to have anything that's fair. Christians from now on are going to be persecuted. They're going to be hated. People who stand for conservatism that obey the Bible, obey the rules, obey the laws. Those people are going to be criticized. Because we live in a eternal unrighteousness stage on this earth right now. Where they think they can do and get away with whatever they want to get away with. And they have. Do they not? Don't they get away with it? They can walk in our office here, right in this church right now. There's nothing to stop them from coming in here. The doors are open. They could come right in here and say, let me have that Bible. We no longer believe in this Bible in this country. You cannot preach it here. Now we'll take our Bibles from us and walk right out the door with them and say, you can't preach our Bible. Now we'll find another one. But eventually it'll continue to get worse to you. They put you in jail. That's what they do in other countries. That's what they've done in other countries. Why should we be any different? Now, aren't you glad, though, when Jesus comes back with us, we will for 1,000 years live in righteousness. We've never experienced that because we've only lived so many years. 50 years is a lot, a lot, a lot of years. But can you imagine 1,000 in righteousness, in holiness, in godliness, with our God in charge? Amen. 
See, he's still in charge right now. But we are in what we call the grace age or the church age. What, what dispensation of time follows the church age? Someone tell me. After the church age, what dispensation comes next? There are seven dispensations. Innocence, conscience, ethnic government, uh, kingdom, uh, no, excuse me, um, promise, uh, Israel or the law, church, and then which one? Kingdom. We're not in the kingdom yet, so we're going by other people's laws. But when the kingdom comes, guess whose law comes? His law. He's the boss. When he comes back and settles things at the end of the seven years, and Armageddon is about is going strong, and the blood is flowing to the bridles of the horses, then Jesus takes over, and the kingdom begins. Then we have a righteous, godly, and holy leader. For how long? Well, what happens after that? Eternity, where God rules, and we live with him. Now, there is our daily physical needs. Notice it says here in verse number, uh, give us this day our what? Daily bread. All right, now, let's just not be, let's just be honest. How many like to eat? I do too. How many get hungry? All right. When you get hungry, the bread is there, isn't it? You know why? Because we have prayed. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Now, I like that. I don't know what kind of bread it is, but evidently there's going to be a different kind of bread than what I'm eating right now because they tell me right now I can't eat bread. Isn't that right? You can't eat bread, Sandy, because that all widen you. I can't imagine eating a bologna sandwich without bread. No. So evidently the Lord's going to have us a bread that's not going to be a fatty bread. Oh, thank you. Man, a type of bread. Good bread. Daily physical needs. That's what we pray for today. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, that's very simple to pray because, you know, we're Christians and we like to take care of the poor. We, you know, there's always a poor man that will come up to me. That, you see him on the corner wherever you go. They got signs. Need bread for my family. That'll get you every time. I've, I've, hey, I've seen that, and I went to McDonald's, bought a bunch of hamburgers, took it out there and handed them to them. I'm, you know, it, it gets me every time. Because you want people to be able to eat. Amen. How many times do you think in the 47 years I've been here that people have dropped by my door? I need some help. 99 and 9 tenths of the people that have asked for help that say they'll pay it back, never pay it back. Right. But why do you keep giving it? Because you don't know that there's not an angel unaware there that you're taking care of. Right. One lady said to me, she said, I need some money. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, how much you need? And she said, $20? I said, well, I don't have 20, but I can get you 20. So I get a $20 from the church. It's your money. We believe in taking care of the poor here. That's in our constitution. That's what we believe in doing. And she looked me right in the face. She said, preacher, here's what she said to me. She said, I know you're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but if you give me a card, I promise to pay this back. Well, months went. I forgot about it. I got a letter in the mail with $20 and an extra 20 to put in the offering plate. 
That's the only time in all those years and all the people I've helped who has paid it back. Amen. You see, we don't want anyone to suffer. We want to take care of them. We want them to eat. So it goes on to say this. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, you know, we have, we're, we have, we're indebted to God. Amen. We forgive people. We ask him to forgive us. By the way, isn't that part of it? Right now you're sitting here a forgiven person. Aren't you glad your debts have been forgiven? Amen. You know, I've, I've always been a poor man. I've never had much. Well, through the process of time and through staying here as long as I have and the people taking care of me and eventually, of course, my kids are all gone and I just, my wife and I, and we started paying off bills. We have no bills now, just got a truck payment out there, that's about all I have. And we have money and I don't have no problem filling out those blanks for $25 to give Bibles to somebody because you know I, I don't have no I don't have a problem now saving money my kids are just tickled to death and I'm saving money you're supposed to laugh at that <laughs> because guess who gets it all Jody when Debbie and I expire my boy's gonna buy every now and then hey dad you still you still uh, you still investing in silver aren't you get a lot deep yeah I never understood the meaning of good until just now you know what I mean and then I give them the bad news that everything I got is going to the church <laughs> they, just, they don't like that but anyway just kidding the thing of it is is that oh by the way can I say this I don't think it hurts anybody in this room that when you, in your will, that you donate to your church. Amen. Brother Webb, when he died, he gave his kids one this, one this, one part of this, one part of this, one part of that, and, he'd eat, and the church got the equal amount that each kid got. You know why? He loved this church. Right. See, how, you see, when you die, you don't quit loving your church. The church must go on. How's it go on if we don't let it help it go on? When I die, a portion of my whatever I have goes to this church. This church is my life. I love the church. Jesus died for the church. He's coming for the church. He cares for the church. Why shouldn't I? Think about that. Something should go to the church. It doesn't have to be all you have. Your children should inherit, no doubt about it. But don't forget your church. Don't forget that. Well, now you're asking for money. I'm, not, I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. You don't have to do nothing. I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. The people in this church are going to be glad when I die. Let me tell you why. Did you know that the church has a $500,000 life insurance policy on me? When I die, Debbie, don't get a dime of it. Who's the beneficiary? The church. If you get this payment down to 500000 and I check out, it's paid off. They call it the, the insurance companies call it the. Key man insurance. Huh? Key man. Key man. Key, man Key man of the church insurance. That's what they call it. Don Lowe said, they saying, how about 700000 Can we get, get 700000 on it? <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but you see the thing of it is is that I don't care I don't care you think I care about that do you think I'm glad that the church gets something but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to take care of the church myself personally too I'm just that kind of guy I love this church it's been good to me by the way you've been good to me and I thank you very much for all that you've done for me somebody brought me soup tonight I think what did you bring me there Miss Laura potato soup Sausage? Oh, sauerkraut and potatoes. That's, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. Somebody gave me ribs the other day. 
And uh, I get more than I deserve by far. I'll tell you that. Tenderness of heart. Don't you think when you pray you should have tender heart? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Everything is all about God when you pray. When you pray, you'll ask. I have some people in this room I'm praying for. I'm praying for this dear lady right here. I'm praying God reach down and touch her and raise her up physically and as a demonstration of his power. I pray for my pianist over here. I pray for her and her husband. I've known them since they were kids. I pray for the deacon board in this church. Dear God, bless their families. Keep them strong. Keep them straight. I pray for Ronnie Smith. I thank God for Ronnie Smith. Steve Courtney, Donnie Lowe. Donnie Lowe's my best friend in life. I've never seen a guy in the world. I mean, I never, I've had some great friends, but Don Lowe, I've teased him till I'm, to, he, he just looks at me and says, you're no good. <laughs> but I love that man as much as I love anybody that's ever walked on the face of this earth. He's my friend. I don't have to worry about him. I don't have to ever worry about losing his friendship. Amen. I love Rick, G. Wal Rick Walters out here, Ricky. I love all you guys. You're my, you're my, you're my people. You're my congregation. You're my friends. I, I pray for my kids. All my kids basically got important jobs in life. I don't know what's going to happen to them. I don't even know where Rodney and David is half the time. But I know that when we're together, it's always been the same. Uh, Roddy hates to come up here. You guys seen it last night. He hates it. He hates to come up here. And, you know, he, 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 but he loved, he is here to see that he was here to see me get that blanket there, uh, Dwayne, that we got. That's the reason he come. He loves his dad. But you know, the thing of it is, is that they, they're busy. They're, they're, they, got a, they got their own churches they go to, except for Dwayne. Dwayne comes here. But I love my family. I pray for him every day. I love my friends. I love my neighbors. But a Christian, when he prays, in this prayer, this model prayer, should have a prayer with a tender heart. Amen. See what it says in ending and closing? Let me just give it to you again. Lead us not, dear God, into what? Temptation. But deliver us from what? Evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That song was sang at my wedding. It was 110 degrees outside, I think, that day. No air conditioning in the church. Lawrence Myers sang that song as we knelt at the altar, and he sang it like this. Our Father which art in heaven hallowed be I, I got sweat running down the room <laughs> sweat just sweat running down my back and he sang that song four times longer than it should have been sang. <laughs> and I had put on my shoes as I knelt. You know, I knew it was going to be kneeling down. I had put on my shoes, S-O-S, -S, you know. <laughs> so everybody could see him. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> life is good, isn't it? And you know what? No matter how bad it gets in this country, no matter how bad it gets in this world, it always should be good here. Yes. You know why? Because of this. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. And because we can pray like he taught us to pray. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the blessings of life and all that you've done for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. 
Help us. Help us, dear God. We need help. Oh, God, we need your help. Please help us. Hear our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.